Greetings, I'm John Duvall. Welcome back to another Truth Factor discussion. We'd like to thank you so much for joining us for our study through the Bible. We're currently in the Gospel of John. In just a few moments, we'll pick up with John chapter 8, verse 1. The actual verse 1. We'll talk about that here in just a few minutes. We'd like to thank you so much for joining us for our study today. If you have joined us through our Facebook page and you're watching us there, then there'll be a comment section connected with this live video stream. We'd love to hear from you. If this is maybe your first time joining us, if you want to say, hey, my name is Bob from Minnesota, that's perfectly fine too. We would love to know who is with us today. If you have any questions or comments, use that means the comment section to share them with us. Also, if you are on our YouTube channel, use the chat area there. That way we can hear from you also. Let us know what you have to think. If you would prefer to use email, you can send those to questions at truthfactorlive.com. Questions at truthfactorlive.com. Or if Brian or Tom or Brendan says something particularly snippety that you want to address, you can write them directly. Brian at truthfactor.com. Same for Brendan and Tom. Don't send it to Thomas. It won't make it to him. It's got to be Tom. Morning, gentlemen. It's good to see everyone here today, especially our honored guest, Brendan. He's been away for a while, tending to some, well, business. I mean, he's preaching engagements and not actual engagements or anything like that, but preaching engagements and stuff like that. <laughs> it's really something to have somebody that everybody <laughs> wants to come here that uh, they, they're calling all around, you know, uh, the rest of us, we, you know, nobody wants to come hear us. So wants us to come to them. I assure you, it, it is it is completely a fluke uh, of my meetings this summer. It just never happens. Well, it's not because of his hair, because I've got that type of hair. So, you know. <laughs> All right. Yeah, there's three hairy guys and one bald man today. So we got to think about that one, too. Well, we're outnumbered then because we yeah. don't have any hair powers. I'm going to, I'm going to call the bears. Yeah. You guys better watch yeah, it. Yeah, That's right. Yeah. All right. Let's see who's all joined us so far. We have Danielle, uh, David, Jimmy, and Jerry so far have all chimed in and there may be others and you may not want to say, uh, drop a comment or anything. That's fine. But we want you to know that we are glad that you've joined us for our study. If you're watching this, uh, on the recorded version later, you can email us as well as we've already talked about. We'd love to hear from you too. All right. So. We are in John chapter eight and the first 11 verses we're going to look at here in just a second, but, or actually the verse, uh, yeah, verse 11, first 11 verses there, depending on the translation you're reading from, you'll have a footnote. If you're reading from like the new American standard Bible or the ESV NIV, some of the, the later ones, you'll have a footnote regarding the fact that this particular section is missing from some ancient manuscripts. And so there's been kind of could be a heated discussion had by some scholars over whether or not this passage belongs in the scriptures there. And you've seen this thing throughout Facebook a good bit where people say, well, this translation has taken away, I don't remember how many, but so many verses from the Bible. And, and a lot of those things are really based on a misunderstanding. One of how we even have verses in the Bible, the verse division, but also it's a misunderstanding of how um, we came to have the translation we do and the manuscripts that is pulled from and everything. And that does relate to um, our discussion a little bit here this morning. So let's see, let's go ahead and talk a few minutes about this. Brian, do you want to go into a little bit more about the history of there? And I know Tom has brought some, some charts we could kind of talk about as well. Yeah, uh, let's go ahead and talk about this. So it's uh, John uh, actually begins in the very last verse of the last chapter. It's John chapter 7, verse 53, through John chapter 8 and verse 11. And there's a there's a debate. There's several passages in the Bible that are sometimes debated as to their place in the Bible. Uh, there's a passage in 1 John chapter 5, which uh, sometimes gets a lot of attention. Uh, sometimes people don't like Mark chapter 16, but, I'm, but I, I think that that one can be demonstrated to be almost purely because of the command to be baptized. This one is interesting because uh, this passage is questioned as to whether or not it belongs here, and there doesn't seem to be a really doctrinal 
uh, uh, danger or a doctrinal pronouncement that comes out of this passage. Other passages, it might be things like the Trinity, the nature of the Godhead, or being baptized, that if you remove that passage, it's affected. This one doesn't really seem to have much of a uh, much of a, a, a reason for, you know, a doctrinal reason for why people might want to remove it. But the question is whether or not this passage is original to the book of John or whether it was added later. Um, and the reason that question comes up is that the oldest manuscripts uh, from which they take the translation of the Bible don't have this passage in there, that it's missing from those. Uh, we call that philosophy of using the oldest manuscripts as the ones to that we that we use as our cornerstones, the critical text method, whereas other manuscript uh, methods are the majority text. The majority of Bible texts, of ancient Greek texts, do have this passage. So those Bibles that are based on the majority text, which would be like the King James, the New King James, um, I think the modern English version, uh, those would be translations that uh, would not bracket this passage because they are going to suggest that because it is in the majority of ancient Bible manuscripts, uh, it belongs there. But, but Bibles like the New American Standard, the English Standard Version, those that use the critical text method, those are going to suggest that this doesn't belong there because it is not in the most critical texts that they have. So that's the question that we have. Okay. All right. Um, Tom, you got any thoughts on it? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, let's see. Do you, uh, let's see. Do you see my picture or are you seeing the, uh, let's see my, I just want to make sure that my slides are on there. We do, Tom. Your beautiful face. Okay. Okay. Well, well, yeah. I, I mean, a, a few years ago, I actually dealt with this when I was talking about the Bible as the Word of God. And, and building on what Brian was saying about that, you know, uh, the earliest where you start seeing this included is about the 8th century. And, and by the way, just remember, just remember biblically, that's 700s. You know, and they say there's only three manuscripts prior to the, the 8th century that actually include this. The earliest, I think, is the 5th century. So you're talking the 400s. Um, and uh, then you have a handful of like the early Latin manuscripts. And it wasn't actually commented on until about the 12th century. That's one point about this. Um, also, the other point about it is it's located in uh, different places in the various manuscripts at least the earlier manuscripts, there are some that place it uh, where we find it. Uh, there, are, uh, there are also others that place it at the end of John. And there's actually, I, uh, I think there's actually some that actually place it at Luke 21 in, in that particular area. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. you, so you have all of those that are there. And, and basically th this shows that even in manuscripts, uh, there's not really agreement as to where it belongs. And, and if, if, if you all can see my screen right now, I, I've just popped up one that actually has a picture of one of the manuscripts. This is a 9th to 10th century manuscript. Can you all see that? Yeah, people at home can see it too. Tom. Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay, okay, yeah. Well, this you is only a 9th use your mouse, and... they might could see that as you oh, okay. highlight. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but anyways, you'll notice on the left, there's actually a, there's actually a, a, a footnote. And that footnote is the insertion of what we are dealing with here, a, a, a part of that. So, so it shows it marginal, and and that's a part of what you're dealing with. And again, it's after John, it's after John seven and verse forty, which is a, a few verses before where we're at. Now, uh, um, the other argument that's made is the wording is a little bit different from the rest of John's gospels, and so from a standpoint of the wording. Uh, uh, it's closer to Luke, which is why I guess it's included in some of Luke. Uh, uh, part, part of that has to do with the reference to him being at, on Mount Olive, Mount of Olives. Yeah. Luke, okay, Luke yeah. would calls it that in two places, but John never calls it that in the other right. rest of the gospel. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. You got that. So, so dealing with the text, you know, it's an event that, and here's the point is this is an event that very much could have happened and was likely passed along orally. And uh, in, in other words, I, I don't think this is something that these scholars that added it just randomly picked something and decided to do it. There was, uh, they probably had some evidence that, that it was 
uh, that it was early on when they do uh, uh, did that. But later on, it actually got added into the text still. Uh, but uh, obviously, we got to be prepared for that. And uh, uh, here's the question, though. Suppose the text is not in the autograph. Uh, would such an event be out of character with the life of Jesus? And I think the answer to that is uh, uh no, it's not out of character with Jesus. We obviously don't have recorded everything that Jesus did. And you read about that in both John chapter 21, the, the very last verses of John, as well as in John chapter 20, which making the point that Jesus did many other things. Then the final observation when we, when we look at that is, you know, you look at what happens here. Uh, Jesus healed both Jews and Gentiles. Jesus forgave sins. Jesus interacted with sinners. Uh, he had compassion for those that the religious leaders condemned and so on. So from a character standpoint, it is definitely not out of character with Jesus. And, and, and so that's my point. So because of that, I don't have a problem sharing it or discussing it you know, in a lesson, if I were to present it in a lesson, I would acknowledge that it is questioned. But then I would go on and talk about it. So that's kind of where I stand with this, uh, with this particular text here. And I think it's worth discussing. All right. Any other thoughts about that? Yeah, John, I, I had a, a few here. Uh, so talking about authorship in the ancient world, it's not as clean cut as, say, authorship you know, in, in how we experience today. So a great example of this is the book of Proverbs. Uh, it's largely attributed to Solomon, but we know that there are the Proverbs of King Lamel at the end of it. There's the Proverbs of Agur. I believe I said that right. There, there's a combination of authorships in yep. that book of Proverbs. Um, you know, there's that as well. Now, I believe the Apostle John wrote majority of the Gospel of John. And in fact, I may even just default to the fact he wrote this chapter too. But just because it doesn't appear to some later manuscripts, my my thought is, as the historian here, uh, and Brian's in that same camp too, uh, but they're copying something. These things just don't appear in a vacuum. There's either an oral tradition, there's a written tradition, and with what we know now of scribal practices of this era, um, they were very, very careful and very stringent on trying to make sure they preserved an accurate representation of the text. In fact, in some Jewish schools of scribal tradition, um, you know, there's an effort to, quote, even restore the text of trying to look at other manuscripts that they had and make sure that the text that they're transcribing is a completed edition. And so I could very well see that these scribes were aware of the account of John 8. The particular manuscript they're copying from did not have that. And so they are at, I don't like the term adding in, but they're transcribing what they know to be an accurate account. And maybe the Greek isn't entirely accurate because they don't have the the chain of custody, as it were. Um, but I would amen everything Brian and Tom said. It, it's just, you know, with this, and I kind of go fall back on the old Providence argument. Uh, maybe it's a cop-out, maybe it's not. But for me, if the Lord saw fit to preserve this particular count for the last 2,000 years in the scriptural record, uh, that's sufficient enough for me to, to take it as scripture. Um, so... I think it's a good point. Good point. All right. Any other thoughts? So there you have it. It's authentic. It's authentic. Just, and I think that's a, I think that's a reasonable position because as soon as we start saying to ourselves, um, this shouldn't be here. And we make it a definitive statement. We then begin to call into question other things. And we open ourselves up to to greater challenges. Um, we won't even talk about what is it, um, First Peter chapter five, First John five. Yeah, First John. First John five. five. Sorry, sorry. There yeah, no First John yeah. five. Yeah, yeah, that's a whole other discussion. But 
But yeah, I think this unless is, you don't like unless yeah. you don't like First Peter chapter five too. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, 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 right. All right. Uh, yeah. There is five. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. So with that being said, let's go ahead and look at the text because with with all that being said and done, there is a great important lesson here. And as has already been talked about, it fits the narrative of the teachings of Jesus, especially in dealing with the hypocrisy of the Pharisees and the fact that um, they were ignoring the weightier matters of the law, love, justice, and mercy, and things of that nature there. So um, let's see, since Brendan has been gone for so long, let's have him pick up with, <laughs> with verse one and read for us, if you would, through verse Let's go ahead and read through verse 12. That's a little bit outside of what we're discussing by one verse, but let's go ahead and kind of keep that all together there. Okay. And I'll be reading from the New King James Version of the Bible. Okay. Let's see here. Um, yeah, mine format is weird, so I guess I'm starting 53 of the last chapter and going through this. That's fine. I'll follow you. Yep. Okay. And everyone went to his own house. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now early in the morning, he came again into the temple. And all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the, mi in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that, we should, that she should be stoned. But what do you say? This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger, as though he did not hear. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. All righty. Appreciate that, Brendan. Um, let me follow up on one more point uh, that Jimmy, a comment that he had thrown in there and say a couple of thoughts, and then we'll go back to the text here. Jimmy says, if you say a passage shouldn't be in the Bible, wouldn't that be taking away what the Bible said? Um, so, and that's kind of the argument that many people will make as far as looking at the differences, translations, they take verses out. But the, the reality is now I'm going to say something that's going to get me in trouble. There are words in our Bible that wasn't in the original Greek texts. Okay. Here's why translations. Um, if you have the older American Standard Version, some of the older King James Versions, and the New American Standard Versions, you'll see a bunch of italicized words. Those are added by the translators to fulfill the, the clarity of thought that is being stated there. So the idea of taking, it's not taking verses out of the Bible. What happens is there, as has already been pointed out, they look at different manuscripts. And some manuscripts will lack certain phrases or statements that other manuscripts will include. And so they have to determine what was originally there. Does this, and you know, does this fit context? Does it fit the teachings of Jesus? Because it's possible there could be manuscripts that the person added something that was never supposed to have been there. Someone who was not doing his job properly. You know, so the, the, the scholars who are trying to make certain we have the most accurate reflection of the word of God, they have to weed through and make certain that what they say is here, here. And so as a result, you'll have some translations that will not have a phrase in there or will use a different wording because the manuscripts they're pulling from worded it differently. So the more the idea about taking things out of the Bible is simply looking at what the Bible says and says, I'm not going to do it. We're going to reject it. Yeah. Um, and, and the statement you're referencing really fits Revelation 
the, the full prophecy there too. Um, but it's, it's a, it's a good point though. It's about authority. And the right, people of God have, have been wrestling with this since the translation of the old Testament into Greek. I, I just recently did yeah. some study on the Septuagint, which is actually a misleading term. In Jesus day, there was probably dozens of different Greek and Hebrew translations of the old Testament circulating, um, that explains why when you see a New Testament author quote the Old Testament, the wording doesn't line up exactly like the Old Testament. And sometimes even the authors of the New Testament aren't even quoting a translation. Sometimes Paul's doing his own translation as he's writing. And what's the goal with all of this? The people of God want the Word of God in the common vernacular so they can understand it. Yeah. That's the goal. Uh, and so... You know, I'm careful to say, well, this was taken out or this was added to. Well, what, translation is more of an art form than it is a science, because even even very two similar languages, uh, things do not directly translate. Uh, a friend of mine is a native Spanish speaker, uh, and yet he tells me that if he goes south of Guatemala, he has a hard time understanding what's being spoken in. Uh, in Brazil or Colombia, uh, because it's technically the same language, but mm -hmm. there's variances in there that it, it makes language sometimes difficult to understand. And think about just how much English has changed in the last 20 years, let alone 30 years or 40 years. So that's right. Yeah, Brian, correct me there. It's like, I wanted to say Portugal, but I'm like, that's not in South America. <laughs> Portuguese, you know, cool. it's the same family, but it, it's a different language. So, you know, are there some who want to take stuff out of the Bible? Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. And there are translations that exist. Thomas Jefferson's tra translation of the Bible is a great example. He just cut out things he didn't like. Uh, that being said, most mainstream translations today are a reflection on a particular desire to make the Word of God understandable. So Christian Standard Bible, NIV, they tried to get it where it was understandable to the common person. Your New American Standards are trying to be as literal to the Greek as possible, which some might say is a is an impossible task, but that's the goal. So think of it as different tools for different jobs when you think of different translations like that. And the goal is still the same. We're trying to get back to the most accurate representation of what God said. And so sometimes if a passage doesn't seem like it fits John's language, some people question that. Like, we, if we want to get what John said, we want to get what John said. Now, as we just discussed, I think we all think that John wrote this or it's accurate to John's account. But yeah. I could monopolize the rest of the time, so I'm, I'm going to be quiet now. But it's an important discussion. So... Right. Well, yeah. Even, oh, yeah. even compiling yeah. Greek Bibles for your interlinears, yeah. you still have the same issue of which manuscripts to pull from. Yeah. Um, real quick, Tom. Yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah, I got yeah. a detour on this, so go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just real, real quick. Um, I don't know if the King James does it, but virtually mm -hmm. every other translation, including the New King James, puts the footnote in there to let you know that it's questionable. And in, in, in other words, or or that the, it's not 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 questionable, but but not in early manuscripts. And and the point is, yeah. is we're not burying our head to this. You know, we acknowledge it there, but we still see the Bible as the Word of God. And and exactly. and, and, and that goes back to the point that Brendan was making. That, that's the effort. Yeah. Uh, so, sometimes not such a good effort, <laughs> uh, but a lot of times I think they do very very good with what they have. All things being equal with the amount of words and verses and passages and phrases, I think they do a great job. There's really only a small number by, by comparison of passages that make you go, huh? You know, and wonder yeah. about it. Yeah. Less, less than 1%. Less yeah. than 1% of passages have any meaningful, meaningful difference. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right. But let's talk about the text here now. Um, let's see. Kayla makes a point, and we, we will we'll talk about that. So going back to verse 2 there, we talk about in early morning, he came again to the temple. All the people came to him. He sat around and taught them. 
So the scribes and Pharisees have a situation that has developed. And scholars debate whether or not it was something that they orchestrated or it was a woman who was caught in adultery, but for whatever reason, the man wasn't caught. Um, the, the oddity here about this is by law, there should have been a witness who had witnessed them come with it. It, it depending on how you put the, the, the set of instructions regarding the text in was it Leviticus, I think it is. Um, but then, but, but the man should have been there as well. But they bring this woman to Christ. She has supposedly been called in adultery. And I say supposedly in that the way everything unfolds, they didn't follow the process of the law to where she should be stoned properly according to the law. And so they bring her to Jesus and it is there to test him, to, to try, try to trick him there. And so as we've already read, she says there, he says, they say, teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now, Moses, the law commanded us that she should be stoned, but you, but what do you say? Verse six, John says they were testing him so they might lay a charge against him. All right. Any thoughts about this before he uh, rises up and answers the question? Well, John, you, you hit on a lot of it, but you know, John's account of the gospel, he really emphasizes in these, in these later chapters of just the blatant disregard of what God actually said, the omitting of what God actually said, and the mischaracterization of justice in the trial of Jesus. So as you point out, this, is, this crime carried a capital punishment, and the law required two or three witnesses for capital punishments. Um, so that that's one thing they don't have. There's They, they say contrary act, but where are the witnesses? Secondly, where's the man? Both were guilty. You, di you didn't just pick one over the other, so both are guilty here. Um, I think the fact that John tells us that these are they're testing Jesus should make everything about the situation suspect. Yeah. Um, it, it is she really caught in it, or are they trying to set up a catch twenty two where Jesus condemns her? It's like, well, she actually didn't do it. Ha ha. We got you. You don't know all things. You know that kind of stuff. Now. I tend to lean that there is some sin involved here. I think there may be the cause of uh, n not adultery per se, but um, some sort of sexual sin is a Jesus call for her to go and sin no more. That I see that as a call to repent and, and, and change her behavior. Um, but, you know, this this whole situation, um, they're, they're claiming to be teachers of the law, claiming to follow the law, and they can't even get these details right um, when it matters most because there's life and death on the line. All right. Good points. All right. Any, Brian or Tom, any thoughts? Not yet. Uh, I, I'll have a comment here uh, in okay. just a few moments. But. All right. So as we go through this, Jesus stoops down. He's writing something on the ground with his finger. Uh, we don't know what it was. We can speculate on it. So they continue to ask him, what was his thoughts on this? You know, what should they do? And so he raises himself up and he says to them something quite simple. He says, he who, is out, who, he who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And then he goes back to writing on the ground again. Now, there are two ways, guys, of kind of looking at this phrase, who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone first. One is, and I've heard this a lot throughout my life, just the general statement, whoever's without sin, you go ahead and throw the stone. But I really wonder if it pertains to this setting, to this event, you know, were they guilty of sin in the way that they have brought her to Jesus? Whether it's a false charge, whether it's bringing and trying to, to, to trick Jesus, whatever. Um, could, could that statement be in reference to that? Um, and that, that would bear a little bit on Caleb's question in, in the chat room. We'll, we'll get to in just a second. Thoughts on that? I don't think it does. Um, uh, I, I know a lot of times people make the comment and say, uh, you know, that Jesus is actually suggesting that they've actually committed this exact sin, but I don't, I don't read it that way. Um, I, I think that uh, really he's just trying to, to make a case to say that the only person who is truly uh, competent to make a judgment is the one who is without sin. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of times where the Bible makes statements like that. I think in okay. James, when James talks about there's only one lawmaker, you know, one lawgiver, uh, who are you to judge another? Uh, that these concepts, uh, one of the one of the concepts here is that is is that this is a fundamental flaw of the law of Moses is that you had a judicial system that had judges that 
you know, were not themselves free from the law and um, uh, free from breaking the law in, in ways. And I don't think it's it's a specific thing. And I, like I said, I know some people have said that and there might be a better case that can be made that I just haven't heard. But I, I don't think that there's any reason for us to suspect that he's really saying they're guilty of this sin um, because they just need to be guilty of any sin to be un, you know, unjust judges. So I think that that would be uh, an, a way to consider it. All right. Yeah, and, and, you know, that's a good point. Uh, uh, I, I hadn't really de- thought about it from the way that John brought it up. And, you know, I, I wonder, <laughs> in my typical fashion, could it be a little bit of both? And, and, and I, I mean, and I, cause, cause obviously the overall point is there, but when he makes the point, you know, let him first cast a stone at her, that was very clear, clearly tied to the accuser, to the accuser who was bringing up an accusation. So, so when you have it from that standpoint, the only way somebody would be qualified to cast a stone is if they were involved in this particular circumstance. And are there, and, are there uh, a witness to it? Yeah. Well, and well, that well, they're involved because they're a witness. Yeah. Well, not not necessarily guilty of the sin. But they are a witness to what has happened, which which leads to the fact uh, we don't know this. But would you put it past the Pharisees to do something to entrap somebody so that they could entrap Jesus? I mean, I mean, looking at how corrupt they were, uh, I wouldn't put it past them. But that's reading into the text because it's not there. You know, okay. uh, and, and so I see both points. I see both points tied to that. And, and that leads to what was Jesus writing? You know, was he writing scripture? Was he writing names? Was he asking, where is the man? And you got you got all the debate about that kind of thing. We don't know because we're not told. All right. Go ahead, Brendan. Any thoughts? Well, just to <clears throat> kind of amen and write a concurring opinion with Brian, uh, <laughs> I think... I think the fact that Jesus stating here he is without sin cast the first stone. This is towards the end of his ministry. My time label timetable is correct in my head. Jesus, by this point, no one has really been able to stick him with anything. Even his okay. critics recognize that he has done no wrong. He has lived a really just, righteous life. And he hasn't been antagonistic or or... or you know, waging a one-man campaign against anyone, really, other than just preaching the kingdom of heaven. And I could see where, after this statement, John does tell us that, starting with the oldest to the youngest, they left due to conviction of their own conscience. Everyone in that room, based on Jesus' statement, realized the wrong, either in their lives or what they've done here. And... You know, I, I think, again, it, it's emphasizing Jesus is the only one who is in a position to really render truly righteous judgment here in this particular situation and in all situations, really. Uh, and, and so that, I guess that's a truth factory moment for us, too. Like, we we have the righteous judge who will render each one perfectly yeah. what we the, the right judgment. Um, so something to chew on there. That's a good point. All right, Brian, problem with getting old. Memory is kind of flaky. You remember last week I said, Brian, haven't we talked about this before? Because it sounds so familiar. All right. I remember. About about a month back, maybe a month and a half half back, one of our members came to me with a question about this. They were teaching a class on the subject. And finally, everything started lining up. So in the the, the text that they went to, because about throwing the first stone, actually wasn't directly related to the case in point of adultery. Um, it had to do, and I can't remember, I have to go back and look at the text, but there was this very specific case that if someone witnessed something and then the charges were brought, they had to be one of the first ones to throw the stone at the individual. Now in the text itself, it didn't necessarily talk about the subject of adultery. It was something else, if memory serves correctly. I have to look that up again. But so that's my confusion from last week. That's so I looked at this a couple months ago, really probably. And, um, and, and that, that's what I thought was interesting is that th- it is a possibility that no one there would have had the right to have thrown the first stone because they may not have witnessed the act, but they brought a woman who 
was charged with being caught in the act. But that doesn't really address the question that we're talking about. Um, I still kind of lean towards the fact that they were all guilty of either hypocrisy or false charges or the sheer fact of, of trying to deceive Jesus and get him to, to convict himself. That is the sin that he's talking about there. Okay, none of them there are in the state because they're all guilty, not of adultery, but they're all guilty in the whole matter of bringing the woman to him. And so, therefore, he's saying, whoever is not a part of this, but you are a witness to it or whatever, however you're going to look at that, you go ahead and throw the first stone. With that being said, I don't have a, a problem at all with the position that y'all are taking because their hearts were corrupt in this, you know, and, and, and not just in this one thing. It's not like, well, they were wrong only on this one point. It's just, it is a symbol of a systematic sinfulness within their lives that brought them to this point as well. So that could then expand even more so, making Jesus really the only righteous one who could pass judgment in this case. And even by law, he might not have been able to pass judgment. You know, the judgment they were looking for. Um, and I do like the fact what Brendan pointed out. I hadn't thought about that earlier that maybe they were trying to set him up. So he said... All right, go ahead, stoner. They could say, ah, you're wanting us to kill someone. Go against the Roman law and, and all that. Um, and, and to that point, mm -hmm. you know, you, you see that with this trial. Uh, the leaders will go to Pilate like, well, it's not lawful for us to kill anybody. And then in the book of Acts, they're killing Christians left and right. So it's it's whenever it's convenient, we'll follow it. When it's not, we'll we'll just reject it. I mean, we're going to get into this at the end of John. The high priest tears his robes, which was strictly forbidden in the law when Jesus confessed, says that he is the Christ. Um, they, they're they getting false witnesses, which by the law, all those false witnesses should have been executed because they're testifying falsely for a capital offense. I mean, there is the, the hypocrisy is you could you could cut it with a dull spoon in John's gospel with how much these religious leaders are just showing their own corruption and and their mismanagement of god's people of the law and they're just picking and choosing yeah. so and and, and that's why this fits uh, yeah yeah um good thing is we don't have to deal with people doing that today even in the political world you know but let's take a minute and brian shared something in our chat room i do want to bring it in just for clarity because i've stated a few things i want to make sure a little bit not accurate so let me let's get it said right deuteronomy 17 beginning of verse 2 follow along here and this is this is roughly what i was talking about a while ago as far as what they might have been referencing um deuteronomy 17 verse 2 if there is found among you within any of your gates which the lord your god gives you a woman or a man who has been wicked in the sight of the lord your god in transgressing his covenant who has gone and served other gods and worshiped them either the sun or moon or any other host of heaven which i've not commanded and it is told you, and you hear of it, then you shall inquire diligently. And if it is indeed true and certain that such an abomination has been committed in Israel, then you shall bring out to your gates that man or woman who has committed that wicked thing, and shall stone to death that man or woman with stones. Whoever is deserving of death shall be put to death on the testimony of two or three witnesses. He shall not be put to death on the testimony of one witness. The hands of the witnesses shall be the first against him to put him to death, and afterward the hands of all the people. So you shall put away the evil from among you. Um, of course, then he can he continues forward there um, in, in that. So the point I was trying to make is that this is talking about idol worship. If you find someone worshiping idols or doing something that would be in worshiping of a false god, then the, the witnesses would be the ones to cast the stone first. Um, now, could this apply to the law they were trying to hold Jesus to? I'm not really certain it's possible, but anyway, I thought, it, thanks Brian for sharing that. That, that was the passage I couldn't remember properly. Yeah. All right. Let's see. Um, where are we at? 1145. So we have a few minutes remaining. Any other thoughts in our text here? I mean, you see uh, them. I, Go ahead. Go ahead, Brian. Yeah. No, it's just, I was going to say that uh, one of the things that's interesting about this text, one reason that um, some people think maybe it had been pulled out of some of the ancient texts was that it was a really hard thing for a lot of uh, believers to accept that Jesus could be what what they thought was 
flippant about adultery, uh, that a woman caught in adultery could be forgiven was was something that they were really troubled by. They felt like adultery ought to have some kind of, you know, you can't just be forgiven and walk away, you know, that there had to be some kind of penalty with it. Um, and it's, it's, I think it's kind of a worthwhile consideration to, to see how the forgiveness of Jesus is just that kind of thing. You know, First John chapter 1 and verse 7, where he talks about, you know, being cleansed of all unrighteousness is a pretty dramatic idea. Um, that doesn't, by the way, take away the consequences of these things. We, you know, we know there are lots of consequences to sin that we have to still face. We have to still live with. Um, those things aren't taken away. Sometimes they're natural. Sometimes they're uh, imposed by society. Sometimes they're even imposed by the scriptures. Uh, consequences to things we've done that we can't, uh, uh, we can't undo. But truth be told, we can be totally forgiven. And that was something I've always I thought when I was doing a little bit of reading about what why different people thought it should or should not be included. That one of the things that the earliest objections to they weren't objecting to it because they thought it stylized or different. They were objecting because they didn't like the message. Um, a lot of people felt like it was just too uh, it was too forgiving. And so I've always thought that's interesting. You know, the idea of it being too forgiving, <clears throat> but it really kind of gives us a sense of the. The quality of mercy that Jesus uh, Jesus gives to us here. Okay. Well, and, and dovetailing on that point, there, um, I think throughout history, I think what you find is most people's objections to certain texts or books of the Bible, more times than not, I'm not ignoring the modern era. More times than not, have nothing to do actually with composition. It's with their conceptions of what God ought to be doing. Uh, whether it's John 8, Martin Luther's problem with Book of James, um, whether it's uh, you know current current rejections of Ezra and not Nehemiah as being in the right, um, you know it, it's I think it says more about our uncomfortability with what was clearly seen in Scripture rather than what Scripture's saying. And you know I'm not trying to dismiss the uncomfortableness, but that should probe us to wrestle more with the text in order to get us in line with the text and not the text being aligned with us. Um, and, you know, that's that's a worthwhile wrestling to go through. Um, and it's necessary because the, Jesus' forgiveness is radical. It is unexpected. And in, in many senses, it's not fair. We don't want it to be fair. But if it was fair, we're all condemned and we have, we have no hope. Um, but this radical forgiveness is what makes God's grace so amazing. Uh, now, as Brian said, I'll amen every point. We still have to deal with consequences. We still have to deal with the ramifications of the sins. This woman, you know, she's going to have to deal with the fact that this was a public event. And she's going to have to deal with the fact that this was her, her sins were dealt with publicly for the rest of her life. You know, that's going to be a consequence. But the, but how sweet the forgiveness when the Lord himself picks you up and says, go and sin no more. Um, I, th I would like to think that made a radical change in our life, as it should make in all of our lives when we have been forgiven. Okay. That's a good point. I've got a question for you, Brendan. Is it kind of an overcast day where you live? Is the clouds kind of moving in and out? It's uh, my <laughs> camera is trying to be smart and keep on adjusting <laughs> the lighting, and it's not, so... My, it looked my, like something around here is trying to be smart. <laughs> Look like you're so, by the window and the clouds are moving. <laughs> so I, I actually have rearranged my office and I need to get a light over here that's going to okay. do that. The windows are now over here. And if I'm facing this direction, it's fine. But it's, yeah, new computer, okay. new lighting. I'll, I'll try and get it fixed. Because right now it's like dark side, light side. Yeah. Follow Brian. He's perfected it to a T. Um <laughs> So let's, uh, let's come back here for a moment. I think, I think what you said is a good point. Um, but coming down to the statement there in verse 9, and, and not to, to beat a dead horse, all right, but the question kind of is, when he says, woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? Is, is he, he's talking about, isn't he, their charge, you know, you know, they need to stone you. So... Uh, in this case of point, when he says, has no one condemned you, has no one found you worthy or deserving or 
to pass judgment to cast the first stone on stone you stone at you. And then she says, no one, Lord. So he says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. In other words, the point is he's not, he's not saying I'm not going to condemn you for having committed adultery. He sounds like he's saying, well, then I'm not going to say, let the first stone be cast either. All right. Because they're not abiding by the law. But then he does clarify, you know, and go and, and sin no more. I, I, and I guess my point is, is that it, it's, Going back to what Brian said, said he's not saying, okay, what you did is okay. There's not a problem with it. He's just saying he's not going to do what they're wanting him to do and what they were themselves were unwilling to do. But he does tell her, go and sin no more, which, which tells us he knows what she did. I think it would be a, an assumption there um, to go and sin no more. Um, any thoughts? I want to bring in Caleb's question here in just a second. But. Well, um, you know, most translations say condemn, um, and that's a right rendering of that. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the the higher authorities, because I, I don't trust my Greek enough to throw it, but anyway, the con the condemn there is, is to pass judgment or sentence. Mm -hmm. uh, and Young's literal, I think, gets that rendered correctly there on um, where are thine accusers did no one pass sentence upon thee, and neither do I pass sentence upon thee either. Because... It's not that she wasn't guilty. I think the fact he says, go and sin no more, indicates there is sin in her life as Jesus being the righteous judge. Right. The issue is this whole situation was a mischaracterization of justice. And you you can't, just like in our legal system, we don't render a verdict when there's been a corruption of the jury or, or the evidence was hidden or the witnesses were not credible. The same thing's happening here. And... So Jesus does not pass sentence. In fact, he gives her new life in a sense. You know, they carry the penalty of death. And she doesn't receive that. She's forgiven, but she's told that go and reform. Go and, yep. you know, don't sin anymore, you know. That's right. Okay. Um, so you agree with me. Just say that. Say, John, you're right. I agree with you. <laughs> Actually, I like your explanation better as far as going back to the Greek words, because when you go back up to the uh, the same word that's used, has no one condemned you, should be the same as neither do I condemn you. You know, it's, it's the, yeah. same, the same point. Same point. Yeah. yeah. Um, back to the question real quick. We have just about six minutes remaining. Earlier, Caleb was really ahead of the game and jumped to the end of the story here. He says, can you go a day without sinning? He says, go and sin no more to the woman. Um, whatever the sin was that she had engaged in, could he be talking about that sin specifically? Or just in general, like he told the man that was lowered down to the ceiling, you know, your sins are forgiven, you know, go and sin no more and things like that. Is it a general call to repentance and not to continue onward in the sin? Well, thought here. And I'm going to borrow something from something I read, mm -hmm. and I think it's true. No one sin exists in a vacuum. So think about that. Sins are interconnected. So what's involved in the sin of adultery? Well, you have to start that relationship with someone you know is married. Um, there has to be a possessing your body and lustful passion, which is a festival. It's not rent yet, but it's it's there. The principle's there. There's coveting of your neighbor's spouse, which is explicitly condemned in the old law. So you, you, there's that there might be some lust involved, pride, coveting. Sin works as a huge web. And where I'm going with this is if he says go and sin no more in the context of her adultery, that also would entail everything that led to that and everything that contributed to that. And so you can you can say repent of this one sin, but as you're repenting of that one sin, you will have to deal with the others. And so I think this yeah. whole idea of oh, sin no more, it's a specific that goes out to a general, if if that makes sense there. That's a good point. Yeah. Um, something and and to touch on what you just said, Brendan, and this this may be an oversimplification, but in Galatians five nineteen, and this is the New King James translation. Paul writes, now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, and cleanness, lewdness, etc. And what I decided to do years ago when people would say, what's uncleanness and lewdness? Again, oversimplification. 
is any and everything that leads to adultery and fornication. You know, like I said, oversimplification of it, but basically anything that leads to fornication, sexual immorality, adultery would be classified or caught up in that uncleanness and, and lewdness. And that's, I think that's a good point. Um, what, whatever lifestyle she lived, you know, the events that brought her to that point. Yeah. Um, and so Brian, you, you, did you say before, beforehand that this was for certain Mary Magdalene? <laughs> he didn't. I said no such thing. Yeah. <laughs> but don't some people believe that? Hurt? Yeah, sure, sure. Um, you know, um, and, and that's that's what we kind of call that one of the Catholic traditions, you know, that yeah, there's no exactly. um, there's utterly no evidence. You know, we're told Mary Magdalene had seven had seven spirits. Is that right? Cast out of her. But excuse me. But uh, no, we have no indication. Uh, right, I was going to throw just a comment <laughs> about uh, Caleb's question. I think Caleb had a neat question. You know, the idea, that, you know, can, can you really be told to go sin no more? Um, I've actually used this very passage to make the statement that God wouldn't tell us to do something that's impossible. Um, the, the Calvinistic concept of sin is that sin is out of our control. You know, that, uh, but, you know, not just Calvinistic, probably the majority of Protestants and Catholics who believe either in a sinful nature, original sin, or the, uh, the, the Calvinistic total depravity. Um, it, one of those three things almost everybody believes, and, and they, they tend to say that, well, we, we just can't help but to sin. But that seems to be completely con contradictory to what the Bible repeatedly calls us to do, not to sin. God doesn't say, hey, I'm going to ask you to do something you can't do. Jesus has said many times, sin no more, sin no more. It is possible. Actually, kind of funny you brought up Galatians 5. I thought maybe you were about to bring up Galatians 5, verse 16, which I think is probably the answer to the question of how... How is it possible to sin no more? And Paul gives us this simple statement. He says, well, if you walk by the Spirit, you don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Um, it's not the idea of saying, oh, I'm just going to stop sinning. It's the idea of saying, I'm going to fill myself with spiritual things. And when I fill myself with spiritual things, I am no longer likely to be committing works of the flesh. You know, I'm no longer to be committing those things that, <coughs> excuse me, I'm getting over COVID. I had a terrible case of it. Um, we're no longer uh, committing these terrible things that we do. I always like to say our life is like a cabinet. It's like a, it's like a cabinet on the wall. And there's only so much space within it. And if we fill it with righteousness, with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, there's not enough room for the works of the flesh, you know, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness. Uh, those things just don't fit in our life. Um, there's only so much space within there. Um, people ask me, why don't I have joy in my life? Well, it's probably because you have something else in its place. There's some other work of the flesh that you have pulled out of that shelf to put in the, the fruit of the spirit. Jesus would say, you know, if a man has a demon cast out, but he doesn't fill it with anything, seven more come back. And I think that there's just an important idea here that, uh, the Caleb's really good question kind of brings to us. It is possibly without sin. But the, the way that we are without sin is by filling ourselves with spiritual things. Um, the person who fills themselves with spiritual things, and that's a whole other conversation, right? How do I fill myself with spiritual things? Well, you know, you add to your faith, virtue, virtue, knowledge, Second Peter chapter 1 talks about it. Uh, Paul talks a lot about it to the Corinthians, about how they need to be filled spiritually, that they, that they have knowledge, and knowledge has puffed them up, but it's love that fills them up. There's just a lot of different things we could we could have that conversation about. But the point is the Bible gives us a lot of direction. Yeah. Most of us just don't want to do it. You know, it's it's like yeah. it's like exercising and getting fit. You know, really there's just one way to exercise one way to get fit. Uh, exercise and eat right. Um, abstain for what you shouldn't eat and exercise your body. Uh, there's just one way to be spiritual. Abstain from what you shouldn't have and exercise your spiritual virtue. And to Brian's point, uh, to uh, kind of a practical thing, and, and this was on a podcast about fitness and all that kind of stuff, but, you know, it, this thing, there's a reason why Paul in 1 Corinthians 9 uses two fitness or athletic illustrations to talk about our spiritual lives. He talks about boxing and talks about running. Okay. And we all have had a day where we thought, wow, today was a really good day, uh, spiritually and, and in our life. So the recipe for spiritual success isn't that hard. Think about those good days you've had where you didn't struggle with any temptations. You really were doing your duty and you you experienced joy. Think about what did you do those days? 
And the thing is, do it the next day. And do it the next day. Like right now, the tra my travel schedule's done, so I finally am getting my eight hours of sleep again. I'm exercising daily. And what do you know? I have more energy. I'm happier. Those kinds of things. And it's about you have a good day, think about what made it good, and start replicating that every single day. Because there's nothing yeah. in the world that is going to prevent you saying, what's stopping you from doing that again? So spiritually, oh, I had time to read my Bible today. Oh, I, I, I seem to struggle with temptation less. Read your Bible the next day. I had time to pray today. Right the next day. You know, I listened to a really good sermon on the way to the way to work today. Do it again. And going back to what Brian said, it's just we know what we should be doing. And I'm not trying to minimize like sometimes getting the, that ball rolling is hard, but we know how to get it rolling and we know how to start developing that and going down that direction. And I think another verse to bring in, and I, I put in the chat, but first John two, one and two. I think John answers that question as, you know, he said, my, my little children, I write these things that you may not sin. That's the goal. God doesn't tell us what to do that is un, impossible to do. So it is possible. But he goes on to say, and if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So there's the goal. Here's the assurance when you fail to meet the goal. But the failure to meet the goal is not an excuse for not pursuing the goal. And I think you go up to seven, eight, nine to talk about that walking in light and that filling yourself with the light and going on that path there. So, yep. I think you're right. I think you're right. And I think it's a good, I think it's a good, good explanation of that. Um, we don't have time to bring in James one, but you know, there's a lot of things being spiritual helps us to keep our desires under control. Being content helps keep those desires under control. And, um, all righty. Well, that brings us to the top of the hour. And now that Tom has decided to return, <laughs> we actually do need to close the study. Uh, we'd like to thank you so much for joining us for our study today as we're studying through the Gospel of John. Let's plan to pick up next Thursday, Lord willing, chapter 8, verse 12. And we'll continue forward there in our discussion. Hey, if you have any questions or comments you'd like to send to us, send them to questions at truthfactorlive.com. If it's something that we can bring into our study, maybe answer next week or in our next upcoming study, we'll do our best to do that. Questions at truthfactorlive.com. All righty, we'll see everyone again next Thursday, 11 o'clock a.m. Central Time, right here at truthfactor.com or on our social medias at truthfactorlive.com. And we'll continue our study through John. We'll see everyone next week. Bye-bye.